functional genes capable of building proteins are extremely rare among all the possible ways there are of arranging the ACs, Gs, and Ts in DNA, or arranging the amino acids, the 20 amino acids in the proteins. I have a colleague, Douglas Axe, who worked 14 years at Cambridge University to investigate the question, well, how rare or common are these uh, functional sequences? And for in, in, in studying a protein of modest length of about 150 amino acids in length, he discovered that for every sequence that will fold into a structure that's capable of doing a protein, a structure called a fold, there were 10 to the 74 power non-functional combinations. Well, what that means is that inevitably, then if you start changing the functional ones very much, you're going to fall into the non-functional abyss because there's just so many more of them in comparison to the ones you want. Now, in addition to that, you might recognize Dr. Steven Meyer from his recent appearances on Joe Rogan and also Pierce Morgan's Uncensored. I've also been honored to have him on this channel. He will also be in the Wisdom Society Book Club in case you're interested in that and getting a little FaceTime with Dr. Meyer. Click the link in the description. But in this video, we're going to watch Dr. Steven Meyer and Jonathan Peugeot. Pure materialism is not sufficient at explaining their recent discoveries in science that are pointing more and more clearly to intelligence and to design and to dare I say, intelligent design. Let's do it. And you brought up the whole question of, of, of random mutations. The, the evolutionary mechanisms do not and are not providing adequate explanations for the origin of information. Mm -hmm. Let's just look at your yeah. the, 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 the mutation selection idea for a minute. If, if in fact the a section of DNA containing information for building a protein is uh, alphabetic or digital in character. And it is. Leroy Hood, our famous biotech uh, expert out here in the Seattle area, just says DNA is contains dig digital code. Richard Dawkins says it's like a machine code. Uh, Francis Crick uh, <clears throat> made very clear that it stored um, information and not just information in a mathematical sense, but information that was also functional. Um, yeah, constra like the, the, yeah, yeah, it's a constraining factor. It's a, right, it, right. It, it's, it's a, it's commanding. It's, it, it's it, giving it, orders. It, it, exactly. Uh, uh, Bill Gates, our also other local hero in the Seattle area says that uh, DNA is like a software program, but much mm -hmm. more complex than any we've devised. So what, well, what do we know about software information in a digital form? Well, if it's functional, we know that you can't change it very much without degrading its function and very quickly uh, causing it to lose function altogether. But what do what do, uh, do the Darwinians uh, propose as the the mechanism by which new form is uh, is generated? Well, they propose that you will have random changes in the section of a gene, the the ACs, Gs, and T in a gene, um, and that some that many of those random changes will be degraded, but uh, occasionally you'll get lucky and you'll get a good one. And then that that one will be will result in a new protein, and that new protein will result in uh, will, will combine with other proteins and form form some sort of anatom new anatomical structure. And as those those uh, those um, changes accumulate, you'll eventually get new new form, new biological form and function. But there's a problem, and that's the problem a problem we know well from our computer world, and that is that the functional sequences are so rare that if you begin to change the, the the bit strings you're inevitably after very few changes going to destroy the function long before you ever get to something new or functional mm -hmm. if i've got a section of code for building an app and i want to evolve it by random changes to generate a new app i'm going to degrade and destroy the existing app long before i find a new series of characters that will give me a new app or a new operating system or something and, and the reason for that is that the, the functional sequences are so rare among all the possible ways of arranging the zeros and ones in computer code. Or we could think do, we could do the same thought experiment with English text. If we've got a line of poetry, time and tide wait for no man, and we want to evolve it into a line from the Principia by Newton, uh, we can, we'll start to change the time and tide, and pretty soon we'll get it, uh, in undecipherable gibberish yeah. long before we get a line from Newton or Hawking or or anybody else. So, and and, and what's going on here? We What's going on is that in all linguistic systems or systems for conveying information digitally or alphabetically, the 
islands or the, the arrangements that are functional can be represented as little tiny islands separated from other little tiny islands by vast spaces of non-functional gibberish. There's a kind of an abyss between them. Mm -hmm. Now, does that, does that same kind of problem apply in biology? Well, it turns out it does. We have strong exper uh, uh, empirical evidence now that the sequences that form functional genes capable of building proteins are extremely rare among all the possible ways there are of arranging the ACs, Gs, and Ts in DNA, or arranging the amino acids, the 20 amino acids in the proteins. I have a colleague, Douglas Axe, who worked 14 years at Cambridge University to investigate the question, well, how rare or common are these uh, functional sequences? And for in, in, in studying a protein of modest length of about 150 amino acids in length, he discovered that for every sequence that will fold into a structure that's capable of doing a protein, a structure called a fold, there were 10 to the 74 power non-functional combinations. Well, what that means is that inevitably, then if you start changing the functional ones very much, you're going to fall into the non-functional abyss because there's just so many more of them in comparison to the ones you want. Now, in addition to that, since Axe has done this work, there've been other scientists who've gotten similar numbers, but there've been scientists, a scientist um, at the Weizmann Institute named Dan Tofik. Axe did his work at Cambridge University. Tofik um, has studied what are called, uh, uh, he studied proteins and he's, he, he mutates them intentionally, mm -hmm. but randomly. Mm -hmm. And he's found that after a very few number of mutations, that the, the, the stable structure called a fold will unravel. Yeah. And if it unravels, there's it can't perform a function. There's nothing there to select. So, and the number of changes that are necessary to cause it to unravel are far fewer are far fewer than the number of changes that need to accumulate to build a new fold. Mm -hmm. So it's a can't get there from here problem. Not only are the functional genes and proteins very rare, they're highly isolated in what's called sequence space in the in the space of all the possible ways there are of arranging the parts. Mm -hmm. So it's very much like the computer analogy. You start changing the zeros and ones, you're going to destroy your computer program or your app long before you generate a new one by random changes. The same problem applies at the genetic level in biology, and that leaves a big unanswered question. How do you explain the origin of new information, the new information you would need to build a new protein, which is kind of the sine qua non of biological innovation? You got to have mm -hmm. new proteins and new protein folds in particular if you're going to build anything. There is a very intriguing growing mountain of evidence that we're finding that is pointing to an intelligent designer. But to me, that is not that that is just an abstraction. And that's ultimately where do we go from here? Right. And I just want to say that if you have been burnt by God or the idea of God or the people of God, please at least pause and consider that something might have gotten mixed up along the way. And there might be, to use some biblical language, trigger warning, some weeds that have been sown in with the wheat. I just urge you, if you will, today, seek God in his word and seek God in prayer and just come with an attitude of, could it, might it possibly be the case that something has been projected onto you that is wrong? Ask God to reveal himself to you if he is truly good. I'm praying for you watching this video that you will know the love of God today. I'm praying that the kindness of God would lead you to repentance like it talks about in scripture. And I'm praying that the idea that you have of God as some kind of either a, a cosmic tyrant, a moral monster, whatever the case may be, I'm praying that that negative view would give way to reality and that you would be able to transcend the same chasm that I have where I experience the love of God in an undeniable way. And in particular, by looking at the cross of Christ and looking at the person of Christ and seeing perfect love manifested toward us in that while we were still dead, he came to make us alive and he offers us abundant life. He says, come unto me, all ye who are heavy laden, I will give ye rest. He offers, as a recent critic of one of my videos pointed out, a ransom for us. We are held captive by forces 
that are nefarious and are against our good, and Christ comes to ransom us, to pay that ransom, and to buy us back for himself, to buy us back from where we're enslaved and to set us free. It's so it's actually so ironic because I think one of the biggest things that causes people to resist the idea of God is that they believe that they're free and that God is in the business of putting shackles on top of people. They think of religious structures and that it's a limitation of fun and freedom, basically, when in reality, the exact opposite is true. The devil's biggest trick is convincing you that he's not real while holding you captive to either your own appetites that never satisfy some ambition that never satisfies, some temporary happiness that always falls short, something that seems good on the surface but ends up hooking you into a pattern of behavior that leaves you ensnared. And here is Christ offering you real abundant life that is also eternal. The devil wants you to believe that God is trying to put you in a box that limits you from fun and freedom, when in reality, you are in a box. If you are living for yourself, you will not be satisfied. There's this huge crisis of meaning that everyone is talking about. And it's because there is a place inside of the human heart that only God can meet, like two puzzle pieces that are designed for each other, like a violin and a bow, et cetera, et cetera. There is a longing in the human heart universally across time and culture that is for God. We ever wonder until we come home to God himself. There's quite a lot of rabbit trails for such a short video, but as I record, as I press record on this camera, I feel in my spirit a desire for lost sheep to come into the fold. And I, and I feel such a strong desire for the people who were in the place where I have been myself of estrangement from God, just a desire that y'all would come home to God and that you would just know who he is, that you would know God through Jesus. He is our hope and there is none other.